structural racism. It's the waters we swim in, <laughs> right? I don't I don't know that we are are ever in a in a situation where it's not present in something we're doing, but you know, as it relates to to healthcare specifically, and even asking the question brought back a lot. <laughs> um, you know, we we see it in in how um and we sort of refer to this as politics of the Black disabled body in the project, um, how you'll have practitioners who literally act afraid to to touch somebody who is Black and disabled, um, who um, just don't even acknowledge that they're in the room, who use cognitive shortcuts and stereotypes to try to create um, intervention plans, um, make assumptions that care partners, you know, guardians, caregivers, whatever term people are using, that they do not have enough education or knowledge um, to, to be in a place to even advocate for their sons and daughters. Um, you know, hear story upon story of, um, you know, how many children um, get left out of um, IEP uh, services um, and ID or IDEA mandated services, right? So having an IEP and 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 all of that um, to getting late diagnosis for autism, you know, it shows up in um, how people get screenings for basic things, you know, um, because it, it was, <laughs> the assumption is made that somehow if you are 40 with IDD, you don't, you you wouldn't want a mammogram or something like it doesn't it doesn't make sense. Right. So some of the same sort of racialized experiences and barriers that, you know, those of us in, who um, don't have IDD um, are exacerbated in in that community, because not only do they see you as black, but then the assumption is you just do not have the the cognitive wherewithal to either care or participate in your in the management of your health in in any kind of way. Welcome to Partners for Advancing Health Equity, a podcast bringing together people working on the forefront of addressing issues of health justice. Here, we create a space for in-depth conversations about what it will take to create the conditions that allow all people to live their healthiest life possible. Hello, and welcome to the Partners for Advancing Health Equity podcast. I'm your host, Karen Bell, Associate Director for Partners for Advancing Health Equity and Assistant Professor at the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. I'm excited to have our guest with us today. First, we have Olivia Cleveland. Olivia is a co-researcher with IDD working on the Disrupting the Cycle Project. She is a community advocate for social justice issues, specifically around disabilities and healthcare. Hi, Olivia. Hi. Hi. Um, next, we have Kalila Johnson. Kalila is an assistant professor of occupational science and occupational therapy in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is the owner and operator of Hashtag Slaying Academia, LLC, and co-host of the Dr. Thoughts podcast. Hi, Kalila. Hi, Karen. Nice to be here. Great. Um, and last but not least, we have Taj Johnson, who is a current Doctor of Occupational Therapy student at Methodist University. He is also a certified occupational therapy assistant practicing at Caramount Regional Medical Center in North Carolina, and he's joining us from the airport. Hi, Taj. Hello. Yes, I'm currently in the airport. Uh, unfortunately, I had a delay, uh, but uh, I'm happy to be here and happy to uh, join you this evening. Great, great. Um, listen, we will interview you all wherever you are. No problem at all. Thanks. Um, thanks for hanging out with me today. Um, we're going to get started by asking Kalila if you can share what your project is now and how you got there. Yeah, thank you um, again for, for having us on. Always excited to um, talk about disrupting the cycle. Um, our project uh, broadly has been um, an action research project aimed to better understand how 
Black people uh, with intellectual and developmental disabilities navigate the health services system in in North Carolina and um, to see if um, through community, and that's bringing together people with IDD, people without IDD providers um, could develop what a model of supports looks like that is both um, culturally affirming, um, but also anti-ableist, like something that is going to support people, both from a, a cultural standpoint, um, but also affirms um, their ability to be able to participate in their own health care. Um, and so currently, we are in process of um, developing products out of that work. Um, and part of being here today <laughs> includes that dissemination process, but also participating in, in community health events, um, writing academic papers, doing public speaking of all kinds. Um, so that one, we are sharing the stories of what happens um, to Black people with IDD um, and their healthcare experiences, um, but also to help uh, fund see the value of this work because it certainly has not been um, an easy project to find funding around. So um, we are still doing the work, but also looking for some more money, Karen. <laughs> I totally understand the, the um, issue of looking for more money and um, what it's like to not have your work be like at the top of the mind of funders or people who think that they are supporting the type of work that you all are doing. They're actually not doing it and not sufficiently. So thank you for um, giving that summary. If you could give a explanation for our listeners who might not know what IDD is. So IDD stands for intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, but intellectual disability itself is a type of developmental disability um, that is typically diagnosed before age of 18 um, and is not sort of exclusive to just limitations in intellectual or cognitive functioning, but also includes some limitation in what we call like adaptive functioning. So those um, additional skills that people need to be able to participate in daily life in, in all sorts of ways ways. Um, yeah, that that is a sort of like basic and, and broad understanding of of IDD. Great. Thanks for explaining that for us. Um, could you talk about your motivation for this study? Yeah. Oh, man, we could talk all day about that. Um, part of my I want to say in part, probably in, in totality, motivation for uh, the project came out of my experiences as an occupational therapy practitioner, um, working with people in community, but also in intermediate care facilities. Um, so developmental centers and things for people with intellectual disability in North Carolina and just finding it very, very difficult to do the type of work that I'm, one, mandated to do as an OT, but the type of OT that I feel like I'm called to do um, in, in terms of people being liberate, liberated, excuse me, um, and their ability to exist as both Black and disabled um, in community. And so I just really got tired of rehab managers or center directors telling me that, you know, as an OT, all I should be doing is distributing equipment um, or it didn't matter if somebody could could participate in community or not because they were going to stay in these institutions until they die um, or seeing people in community and knowing that they needed assistance from OT, but had never seen an OT before or hearing doctors say, well, you know, what, what do they know? Or they can't do this. They can't do that. They can't participate. They don't understand. Um, and I just got tired of hearing it and um, decided that, you know, at the time I was pursuing a PhD and I'm like, you know, this is not just part of a professional commitment I have as an occupational therapist. Like, I really feel like this, like these issues are put in front of me because I am in a position to do something about it. Um, and in doing so, disrupting this cycle also sort of developed out of that. And thankfully, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, saw the value in the work and decided to fund it. Um, but yeah, those those clinical experiences really, really drove me into health services work that is specific to sort of a, 
uh, dealing with issues around race equity and healthcare for for people with intellectual developmental disabilities. Thanks for um, explaining that. One of the things that stood out to me when you were talking is that you used the phrase being black and being disabled. And um, my next question on my my list of questions is to ask about racial and ethnic um, inequities in Mm -hmm. IDD. Um, And I'm not sure if that's the right question, but I'll ask it. Um, and see if it's the right question, if I'm if I'm asking it right. Yeah, yeah. No, I think part part of what I hear you asking is sort of the, the intersections of being racially minoritized and also disabled and how how that shows up. Um, and, you know, I don't I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that, you know, we have healthcare, not even just healthcare, right? Just disparities across all life domains. If you are a minoritized person in the United States, well, when you couple that with also being disabled, as you can imagine, the health outcomes are even even more poor, right? So everything from whether or not somebody has insurance, how do they have housing, do they have employment, how have they been able to access education, um, you know, in addition to whether or not they actually have a usual source of care, um, you know, the, the numbers are bleak. And so while I think as as scholars, researchers, practitioners, even we and I'm going to use the word admire. Right. Because I feel like people talk about disparities all the time, like disparities is not a, a word that's not uncommon to us. The what are we going to do about it part seems to be left off of people's agendas. Um, and that 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 is the part that, you know, this project is aiming to do, um, because we have known for a very, very long time that disparities exist for black people. They exist for disabled. And if you are uh, disabled people and if you are at the intersections of those two, you you are fighting for your life, essentially. Um yeah. We have to get beyond admiring the problems. <laughs> you 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 use different words than what I use. You know, when I'm teaching my classes, I talk about how we in the in our society talk about disparities or inequities as spectacle and how we literally, you know, gasp and oh my gosh, it's tragic, it's all of these words that you, people are supposed to use when they see something that's a quote unquote spectacle, Mm -hmm. but they don't do anything about it. It's sort of like people can sit back and just observe um, and they feel good that they're acknowledging these things, but they don't, they don't go beyond that. So yeah, thank you for using those words as well to, to describe um, the state that we're in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, My next question was going to be about, racism, um, structural racism, systemic racism, whichever phrase um, or term people like to use, how do you see that um, in your work or in these issues that you all are working on? Gosh, you know, structural racism is the waters we swim in, right? I don't I don't know that we are are ever in a in a situation where it's not present in something we're doing, but you know, as it relates to to healthcare specifically, and even asking the question brought back a lot. <laughs> um, you know, we we see it in in how um, and we sort of refer to this as politics of the Black disabled body in the project. Um, how you'll have practitioners who literally act afraid to to touch somebody who is black and disabled um who um just don't even acknowledge that they're in the room who use cognitive shortcuts and stereotypes to try to create um intervention plans um make assumptions that care partners you know guardians caregivers whatever term people are using that they do not have enough education or knowledge um, to to be in a place to even advocate for their sons and daughters. Um, You know, hear story upon story of, um, you know, how many children um, get left out of um, IEP uh, services um, and ID or IDEA mandated services, right? So having an IEP and 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 all of that um, to getting late diagnosis for autism, you know, it shows up in um, how people get screenings for basic things, 
you know, um, because and what the assumption is made that somehow if you are 40 with IDD, you don't you you wouldn't want a mammogram or something like it doesn't it doesn't make sense. Right. So some of the same sort of racialized experiences and barriers that, you know, those of us in, who um, don't have IDD um, are exacerbated in in that community because not only do they see you as black, but then the assumption is you just do not have the the cognitive wherewithal to either care or participate in you in the management of your health in in any kind of way. I think I'll ask you, um, Khalila, but I'm also going to ask Olivia and Taj later. Um, but Khalila, I'll ask you right now: What do yeah. you want? Or what should healthcare look like for people with IDD? Like what what do you want healthcare providers to do instead of what they're doing? Mm. Wow, that is a big question. <laughs> um one, to to first see them as human beings that are there to participate in the healthcare process. Um, and to make sure that that they provide the necessary time um, for people to process and participate in ways that they need, which also means that providers need to educate themselves on what it means to have an, an adapted healthcare experience. So if people need alternative means of communication that that's made available, um, if additional education around what happens in the healthcare encounter is needed, then then that happens. Um, or to do some continuing education just about disabilities in general, you know, that is... It, why why is disability a specialty um, or why is it uh, just a module in someone's course or why do we sort of just leave it to those who um, end up being developmental pediatricians like people who are children with IDD grow up to be adults with IDD. Um, care should also look integrated, you know, um, and I, I, I believe that for everybody, but, you know, especially for, for people who have specialized services, providers should be in communication with each other um, about the care as well. You know, um, people with IDD should not have to um, be re-traumatized um, and have to tell these health stories over and over and over to people who may or may not even get it. You know, so having a, a healthcare situation where people are first seen as people um, and that their 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 bodies are seen for and cared after with the utmost respect, ultimately. Um, yeah. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to ask some questions of Taj and Olivia. Um, first, I want to ask Olivia, why did you um, decide to join this study? It was an opportunity to use my voice um, to speak up on something that I felt powerless, um, usually speaking up for, um, which is my health, especially with doctors or um, nurses. So yeah, to the, the ability, the opportunity to share my experience and have it mattered, have, have it documented so that people like me don't have to go through this. Thank you. Um, Taj, what about you? Why did you join this study? What got me to want to join um, this research is, well, one, I wanted to know who Dr. Johnson was, first of all. <laughs> so I wanted to know, you know, what was her reasoning behind it? Because I was, a, I was actually introduced to this at a convention. I didn't even really know what it was at first. And then, I, and then it sparked the interest in me because this is what I was already doing. I just didn't know anyone anyone else was doing it. So this was an opportunity to really like increase awareness, improve training, policy changes, um, you know, just kind of get involved in the community in another way in OT, which where OT really wasn't involved or where OT really didn't have a place in, in a sense uh, because no one was really doing that work. Uh, so it was a great opportunity um, just to improve on ethic on disparities. Thanks. I I think I I will want to ask a question about like the process of 
uh, putting this study together? And how how did you, Kalila, uh, recruit providers? I know there are different um, types of um, people uh, in the study, but how did you recruit each type of person, really providers, other researchers? Um, Olivia has the title of co-researcher. How, how did all of that come together? Yeah, um, so um, all of our disrupting a cycle partners um, are included sort of at the level of co-researcher. Um, I, I just believe in action research that if if you are really aiming to address the needs of the community that they, they are key personnel too, you know? Um, and so uh, part of uh, my recruiting efforts were tapping into people I was already in community with. Um, so, you know, some of these um, relationships have existed since I came to North Carolina in 2012. Um, and so when those people were sort of able to connect me with others and 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 vouch for me, right, um, vet who I was, because I have been in this space and I'm also a Black identifying female, does it, does it mean I automatically get access to people? So it was really important that you know, I had people in the community who could could serve as as brokers, really, to help cultivate um, additional relationships. And so um, while I felt that was fairly easy to do um, in the IDD community, it really fell flat with with providers, um, <laughs> which I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by. But, you know, I'm a part of a, an academic healthcare institution, so I was legit surprised. Um, so um, as as Taj sort of referenced, I ended up um, because I had people, some providers who um, consented to be a part of the study, but wouldn't show up for meetings and what have you. Um, a mentor recommended that I try professional meetings and conferences. And so adapted my IRB to be able to do that, to recruit and also collect data in the same place. Uh, pitched the idea to the North Carolina OT Association as, um, you know, a way to do a forum as part of, of my presentation with the understanding that I am, I am here to do this particular thing, but this is how it addresses sort of the theme of the conference. They were willing to approve it. And um, I had... Uh, 27 um, attendees in in the in the session, um, which numbers that you know it doesn't sound like a lot, but given that this is a, a conference that only a couple hundred people go to, um, I thought it was pretty good. Um, and so, you know, uh, talked to everybody about disrupting the cycle, the importance of race equity in healthcare, the purpose of the project, and really how it was going to elevate the profession in terms of our visibility in the IDD community, but our commitment to justice um, and really what our code of ethics call us to do as practitioners. And I really think that that resonated with people who see their practice in that way. Um, And so thankfully, um, Taj, along with with several others, uh, consented to being a part of the project. And it has just been um, um, amazing as an understatement, but to have people who are practitioners, but also have, you know, deep experiences in the IDD community, not just professional experience, but lived experience um, as well, has been invaluable to to the project. And so I'm glad I mis- listened to that mentor um, to do that, because I really think it it changed the the project in ways that I just didn't anticipate. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And thanks for for explaining that experience. Um, Olivia, I want to ask you a question. Um, if you could share or just tell us what about the experiences of people with IDD and how do you think those experiences affect care? We sometimes go feeling like automatically feeling like we won't be listened to, at least for me, that's how I feel. Um, Some of us may have a stutter, we may forget, um, we may take a long time to process things. So when we go into our doctor's appointments or um, go into speak to our healthcare provider, we're either extremely um, 
I want to say dasa, but I think that might be the wrong word. But we we are, yes, we'll take whatever you give us. Um, a lot of the times we don't argue because we've argued before and that didn't work out for us. Um, some of us, if we, um, we might get too loud when we get emotional or accident, look, excuse me, accident, I'm, I'm choking a little bit because this is this is live for me and i've i've seen it happen um but some of us might accidentally become overly aggressive or overly expressionate um which turns our healthcare provider off or our doctor off um to listening to us they might they may just automatically close their ears to what we're saying um s- sometimes we can speak too fast if we're really nervous um or we might have a special particular way of communicating. Maybe we wrote down what we want um, and something that's not usual for a healthcare provider. And they that um, our way of advocating for ourselves, if it's different, it may make our provider uncomfortable. And so they respond to us by dismissing um, what we're saying or uh, how, well, dismissing us. Uh, uh, and um, I, I'm not sure how to explain it. I, it's, it's not necessarily dismissing us on purpose, but the experience makes them uncomfortable because they don't know how to communicate with us or accept our way of communicating. Yeah, I I think you did a great job explaining that. Um, and it's a lot for people who don't have IDD to think about, um, even to just hear. So thanks for explaining that. Uh, my my next question is, um, could you tell us a bit about your own experience and what you see? Yes, and I think I may have touched on this in the last question as well. Um I have been, until recently, I've been very um, quiet and just accepting whatever the doctor would tell me because they don't listen. They haven't listened to me. Um, I I would come in and um, they would ask me, what can I help you with today? But that's such a big question for me. Like they're like my mind immediately goes to, well, I couldn't get um, uh, my my rides. Uh, it was late this morning. You can help me with that. Um, it, it it's just it's such a big question. Like you can help me with the homework I was trying to do last night. Like that's where my mind goes um, because of my IDD. Um, So I would say, that's a big question. Can you ask me something else? Well, why are you here? And then I'll start thinking, well, it is a doctor's office. So I'm I'm here to get help, I guess. I I don't really know. Um, But before I walked in there, before they asked the question, I knew I may have written it down. I may have it on my phone. I just completely forget that entirely, that I do have it written down or I do have um, my issue on my phone. And so then I'm I'm stuttering and I'm trying to sort through all the things that I could possibly need help with um, or all the things I could possibly come to the doctors for. Like, well, I've been struggling to eat. Um, my eyes been hurting. I did have a headache yesterday. It, it's just, um, uh, it's, it's a lot. And actually, even right now, I forgot what your question is if you don't if you don't mind uh repeating it for me absolutely no problem um the question was tell us a bit about your own experience and what you see yes okay so that was my experience um i have seen in the waiting room nurses become a bit aggressive if um the patient coming in speaks to them too loudly or doesn't um doesn't use the the right words to express what they need or um to express their time crunch there was 
um, a lady with a slur. She she came into um, the doctor's office and she was saying, how long is this going to take? Uh, she was saying, this is taking too long. I have to go somewhere. I have appointment. Um, I'm not able to, to really uh, repeat what she said because she was speaking in a broken way. She was um, using broken English. Uh, but she, she she came in and she was just she was loud about it. Basically, she was very aggressive, uh, very um, animated, like uh, arms up and all over the place. And the nurse said, ma'am, I'm going to need you to sit. I need you to sit down. I need you to back up away from the desk and relax. And she. She what she didn't mean to be aggressive, and I know that because I've been in that situation. She was just panicking because she had somewhere else to go, and she needed to understand how long it was going to take for her to see the doctor. Um, so that's that's what I see. Thank you for those examples. Um, my next question is: What have you done to counteract negative experiences? I've decided to email my doctor before I go to see them um, and let them know what I'll be bringing with me. So I'm going to write down what I need help with. And I'm going to let them know ahead of time. I have memory issues. Uh, I I will prepare for my visit, um, but I might not always remember um, what I did to prepare. So just to let you know ahead of time, I'm going to bring a note with all of my symptoms written down. Um, I'm going to bring a note with all my questions written down um, and changes I've made um, to help with those. And um, uh, just so they can communicate, just so we can communicate better, because I think it's my issues have mainly been a lack of communication. also, sometimes doctors or nurses see that I have facial paralysis and they act like um, it's something that could rub off on them or a disease, which makes me feel really small. So I, I'm i going to try um, to just explain to them this is a symptom of my brain injury that I had when I was little. It's you know, it's not something to be worried about. Um, I'm getting emotional because I'm afraid to experience that again. But um, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing to prepare for my next my next doctor's appointment. I I'm thinking about what that experience could be like. And I'm wondering what would you want the experience to be like, or, or let me re re-ask that or restate that. What would you want an experience to feel like when you are going to the doctor or going for some sort of health care? I would like to feel heard and understood. I, uh, I know that there's a time crunch between appointments, um, but if I was given the time to get my thoughts out, um, given the space I need to repeat myself um, and and not feel like I have to um, uh, mask or or come off a certain way in order to get what I need. Um, And gosh, I would love to go into the doctor's office and and sign in and they give me a questionnaire saying, here you go, Miss Cleveland. And I'll be able to fill it out and uh, read, read every question, write down how I'm feeling before I get into the doctor's office and the doctor have that with them. Um, Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. But to be able to say, uh, um, or, or to just be able to, when I schedule the appointment to put that in there, um, that would be helpful because I'm not a- always able to do that unless it's a special um, circumstance. Thanks. Um, I, I think what one of the things um, that stood out for me was 
this idea of, and actually Kalila, you first mentioned this, but Olivia, you, when you were describing um, both your experiences as well as other people who have IDD, their experiences, how this idea of disability being a specialty, like some doctors should know about this, should know, excuse me, should know how to treat um, and provide care for people with ID, IDD. But it sounds like all doctors and all providers should be not only knowledgeable, but their practices should be accommodating to people with IDD. Am I hearing that wrong or, or right or correct me? This is an additional question. So, uh, so not, not yeah. just for people with IDD, but with, for people with um, disabilities in general. Uh, all of us together feel like we're not listened to. So just like a, just, I feel like a doctor's office, well, I feel like this is too much to ask, but I feel like a doctor's office should be a safe place. Um, we should be able to come in with whatever we have and not feel um, judged or feel like we're not gonna, I'm sorry, I forgot your question, I apologize. That's okay. You were saying that um, everybody, any anybody with a disability, should feel a, or should feel or be treated a certain way. Um, yeah. 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 Go ahead. We we should feel heard and and feel like we're treated normally. Um, yeah. I actually. Um, well, I'm gonna cry when I think about this, but the most normal I've ever felt treated by someone was someone with um uh, what I had and the only reason they were able to treat me normally was because they had training like extensive training and they were able to communicate that to me um uh, and and they were able to break down the questions for me um, I remember it was an it was a job interview, and I just cried. I was like, "Oh my God, thank you so much! I I never felt this way before." Um, which after the interview just made me feel worse because why haven't I ever felt that way? Why haven't I ever felt like I could communicate with someone on my own? without my mom being there or without a family member or someone else. Uh, just, I don't understand, especially in the doctor's office. That's kind of, that, that, that's when it really hurts. Um, yeah. Uh, First of all, you don't have to apologize. Second of all, um, it's not fair. I'm sorry that you've had those experiences and r really those are my, that was my last question um, directed specifically to you, Olivia. But um, I think that the remaining questions, if you have comments or anything else that you want to add, just, you know, unmute yourself or say, Hey, I have something to say. Um, but what you shared is more than I think most of our listeners have ever thought about. So yeah, you you your voice is definitely being heard. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm I'm saying sorry so much. Uh well, I can't remember enough to say why I'm saying sorry, but um it, it has to do with feeling um like I'm taking up too much space or too much room or um being rushed so many times, not mm -hmm. just in in the doctor's office or, um, but in general, uh, I feel like sometimes I have to say sorry for existing or being the way I am because of how I'm treated, like, like an inconvenience. Um, so that, that's why I do it so often. That's why, um, I cried. And I said sorry for it because <laughs> I was like, oh, darn, I'm breaking up the the um, 
the mood or uh, bringing it down. So, yeah. You're not. And um, I had to teach myself to stop saying sorry. Um, So it's not an uncommon experience for Black women in particular to always having to be saying, I'm sorry, or I'm in the way. And you can take up as much space as you want in this podcast, um, in this recording. So yeah, whenever you want to jump back in, totally up to you. Just let me know. Okay. All right. Uh, Sorry. Now, see, I just said, sorry. Yikes. (laughs) All right. Let me ask a question to, um, I think both Taj and Kalila, um, and so sometimes, and Olivia, if, again, if you want to jump in, just let me know, um, or just, you know, let us know. It's no problem. The question is, what are some of the ways that care providers are getting it right and how are they getting it right? Um, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I think I got, got the nod from Taj. Um, so I, and I, I think it speaks to some of the incredible examples Olivia just provided. Um, it's the the provider who touches base with their patient and their family before the visit. You know, they ask they ask the questions. You know, what supports do you need before um, before your visit, so that you know if transportation is a problem, the practice can actually help out with that. You know, there's there are not too many places that do that. But if you're receiving Medicaid services, transportation is a part of that. So making sure that your patient can even make it to an appointment um, and and spacing out the necessary time that is needed. Um, so adding another 30 minutes, either on the front end or the back end, like automatically using that buffer Um you know, making sure that the sensory experience is what it needs to be. So whether or not there are going to be a lot of people in the waiting room when someone arrives, um, if the lighting needs to be adjusted, if temperature needs to be adjusted, um, you know, just making sure that um, people are being thorough in their asks for what kinds of supports are needed. Um, And, you know, doing that, that additional planning around what the actual sort of care looks like in terms of um, if an exam needs to happen. Um, If if there's not an exam, like what other sort of procedure or non-invasive procedure needs to happen and doing the necessary education around that. And in a way that the patient needs, you know, it doesn't always need to be written language. You know, do you have video available? Is there auditory available? Do people need um, picture symbols as as part of their um, treatment and evaluation when they come into the visit? You know, just thinking about what, what does support look like? What do um, adaptations in our daily practices look like and doing that work on the front end. Um, I think too often providers are, they're scrambling on the back end and then you have, end up having the kinds of experiences Olivia has, whether it's intended or not, harm is done when you don't do the work up front. Uh, But also being willing to say you messed up you know, and, and, and asking, being a partner, a thought partner with your patients about how to make this better. So it doesn't happen again for them or perpetuate the same sort of harm with anybody else with, um, ID or any other disability that comes into the office. Um, and in my 18 years of practice, I've probably only seen that happen twice. That's how bad off we are. And we, and we have the ability to do better. And where that that starts and ends yeah, it can can be up for debate, but we clearly clearly have so much more work to do. What do you think, Taj? All right. Um, so I, I think um, some of the things that I need to focus on is uh, cu- culture competency training. Excuse me, culture competency training. Um, I know that was something that um, my cohort focused on heavily. Uh, just because we had a push, we had a voice for it in, in, the, in the classroom, right? You probably don't have that everywhere. Um, and then, like, being a, having this podcast available to even right now, right? So learning from, you know, having that, that experience listening to now and under, understanding the un, unique need um, for a better experience for, um, 
marginalized people with IDD. Also, like some like collaborative care. So, like um, you know, involving like spe- like different specialists, social workers, physicians, uh, all healthcare pre- uh, professionals, so they they can address the same aspects of uh, the patient's health and well being. So that they're all on the same page, right? So. Um, and then advocating for like transportation. I know that's like one of the biggest things, right? How is the patient going to get there? So advocating uh, for, you know, at the local or the state level to have access for more modern, modern, um, excuse me, more access for individuals with IED, right? Um, and more funding for IED, right? More improved insurance coverage or just better support for the caregivers in general. Um, What I'm also hearing is that this is a huge or what you all are doing and what you all are asking for is probably not probably definitely a huge difference from what providers are currently doing. So I wanted to ask about the provider's experience when they do decide to buy into the study, when they decide to participate, how are they responding to some of the things you all are doing? I feel like it's been mixed. You know, um, when I've spoken about disrupting the cycle um, with with larger audiences, I think of of mixed groups. Um, the The reception has been, oh yeah, like we 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 know this is a thing, and that's sort of where it stops. <laughs> um, but then you have some that are like, okay, I recognize that I I have missed the mark. Um, or admit that, you know, I just, I clam up if somebody has a disability because I'm afraid of X, Y, Z. Um, and so there's some real, um, curiosity, if you will, about how to, um, have a better practice, but also a, a, a praxis, um, in, in making sure that they are providing the utmost care for, for all their clients and doing so in a way that's, um, Meet, meeting the needs in a way that people need, um, meeting, meeting their needs in the way people need. It's like, you say I need a lot, but there is, there needs to be intention, right? In providing care in a way that is most effective and meaningful for people. I'll say it that way. Um, I, I think in the uh, sort of current climate that we're in around, you know, understanding disability, equity, inclusion, accessibility, justice, belonging, you know, all of the 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 buzzwords that are DEI or DEI adjacent. Um, I, I think in in that, though, people have a real concern of making sure that that they are providing the utmost care and not doing harm. But there seems to be a disconnect with either how to to take the evidence that is there uh, from the literature and apply it in in ways that make sense for their practice. Um, You know, Olivia and Taj have already talked about time um, and and sort of what people um, with IDD need versus, you know, what is actually provided um, and how these needs are just don't, uh, it's hard to sort of situate them in, in the ways that, um, medical appointments specifically run. Right. Um, and so I, I don't know, I sort of get the sense that while people care about it, it's also, well, what can I do about it? Um, I think in occupational therapies, uh, those specific spaces, there is a, a sense that, you know, people have like, duh, well, we're OTs. We already know about this. And we, you know, we can already sort of meet the disabled community <laughs> where they are. But what but what people don't hear in that is the very um, sort of paternalistic and um, I know best uh, kind of tone in that. Like you, the, the OT is the expert and not not the person with IDD is being the expert in their own bodies and their own experiences. And, you know, sort of failing to turn that that critical eye inward to say this, this is why the disability community has also uh, critiqued and problematized OT because we have always positioned ourselves as the people who fix 
um, instead of approaching care from a collaborative standpoint and and as the learner and the facilitator and not the authoritarian. Um, and those disciplinary habits are are hard to break. Um, and so while I, I still have a sense of of hope in in terms of what we're able to do from a practice standpoint and a research standpoint, um, you know, I, I recognize that the the system in which people have to work, so whether that is both practice or research, um, layered on with sort of the 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 racialized ways that we have to are, are sort of socialized to live, I should say, in the United States, it, it really makes this a uh, quite the incredible hill to climb. So from my from my personal experience, it's been like like Dr. Johnson said, um, you know, people give me that like, oh, it's, it, this is important. Um, you can train someone all day, but you know, if they if if they're all about uh, productivity and time. Right. Because we all have productivity. Right. It's not, not just the physician. You know, if, if it's not in that 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 two unit window, three unit window, four unit unit window, it's not happening. Right. They're going to move on to the next patient. Right. So how do you get it to where you can explain that to a therapy, a therapy manager? You know, so, we, you know, you have your own challenges, too, you know, and not everyone sees the importance of it. They just see the value in the dollar. So if you know if it's not within that window, it's not within this time. It just won't happen. We'll have to push it on to another time. But there is no other time but now. Um, so you know, we just need more of a voice. Thank y'all for for explaining that. What it makes me think of is you know you all are OTs, patients, providers. You're in this world, and my question is for people who are not. Um, in this type of setting, what what you all are doing specifically. Um, Our project here at Tulane, the Partners for Advancing Health Equity, is a national collaborative that brings together different sectors such as academia, philanthropy, the private sector, government, and community organizations to advance health equity. Um, that being said, how do you all feel your work should be understood and applied to other sectors like these that might not be thinking about this topic, this equity issue like you all do? Yeah, thank you for for that question. Um, some of the things that immediately come to mind is that when you have organizations, whether it is related to training, uh, funding research, um, practice around these issues if the communities you hope to reach are not actually a part of your decision making processes or at least leading the work it won't it won't have impact um and that that is one of the things that i think probably gets under my skin the most <laughs> about um health services research, health equity, race equity work of all kinds. They say, well, these disparities exist, but the boards of these groups are not diverse. Um, the portfolio funding portfolios are not diverse. Um, and even the research questions that they ask don't make sense for the communities. Um, and I think if we uh, I what I what I hope is that um, as people listen to this podcast, um, read some of the work, go to website, whatever, that they see that it is important that to do this work and I think to do it effectively, the communities that are directly impacted have to lead um, and at minimum be partners in the work, not just participants, but partners in the work. Um, and, you know, around education and training specifically, um, I would hope that in in medicine um, and nursing, health sciences, um, anybody that interfaces with patient communities, um, see this as an opportunity to really um, integrate um, um, 
I, I, what is really coming to mind is, you know, sort of like justice and anti-ableism and I mean, or anti-ableist um, and uh, culturally affirming sort of tenets into how they teach, but not as this sort of isolated um, kind of a course. This is something that should be um, a thread throughout the entire curriculum. So it is not an exception um, to how to how we teach um, and and. and consequently becomes this specialty, this thing that, you know, those other professionals do over there. Right. Um, that, that is, that, that is my hope. That is my hope. Oh uh, yeah. So I feel, um, you know, it'd be great to have a participation in the training from the leaders, right. And the leaders in their own communities, their own workplaces, um, you know, Obviously, for like advocacy, community organizations, cultural competency, I can't say that enough. Um, maybe uh, individuals in healthcare just to share their best practices, like like what's working in their profession, like what strategies, what best best practices are addressing the ethnic disparities of IDD. Um, you know, implement some competency training, access to care. Um, community, like with the community organization, and then advocating with the participants, right? Advocating with individuals with IDD on the local, the social, uh, I'm excuse me, the local, the state, and the national level, um, you know, increase to increase the funding so that you have more time, right? Improve the coverage so that you have more time, uh, and then give, give better support for the caregivers, uh, right? And then lastly, just the engagement, um, just actively engaging, right? Not just do it for one time, actively do it. Continue to do it, um, continue to make it available, continue to build the trust that, that they need in the IDD community and then between healthcare providers as well and, um, you know, the minority communities as well. So, you know, it's, 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 it's not a list of things, but, you know, those four would be a great start. Um, I just want to add in here, I think um, for us, for people experiencing this right now, um, just a booklet, a, um, a quick booklet um, available, open source, uh, accessible by everyone online, uh, listing how to communicate with people with IDD, um, or people with disabilities, um, how to work with them, how to talk to them, how to give them the care they ask for um, would be nice. And I think that would be a good start. Uh, classes are great, workshops are great, but not everyone is gonna travel to it or pay for it. And I say that coming from high school, um, my, uh, teacher exceptional um exceptional children's teacher she would give a workshop uh every year to all the teachers on how to communicate with us how to work with us um how to help us succeed in their class and for a lot of people they either forgot it because they have their own beliefs that were just so ingrained in them um one thing being that kids who need the CHET test, well, quickly, one thing being kids who need the test broken up are trying to teach cheat, or kids who need longer time are um, also trying to cheat. Um, so I think just having something that anyone can access, anyone can go to, the patients as well as the provider on how to interact and communicate with each other would be a good start. That would work for us. Um, and I, I say that because I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I say that because we need something now. Um, and if the doctor doesn't read it, the nurse will. Uh, if the nurse doesn't read it, the patient will. If the patient doesn't read it, someone in the patient's family will. And then they will communicate and it'll trickle down. Um, yeah. And I think everything else is is awesome, but that's just from, from my experience uh, 
for now. Um, thank you all for answering that question. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, and you all brought up so many different things that it's going to be something that I think everyone who's listening, including our organization or our project, um, will be able to grow from and, and do better, really. Um, and I really appreciate the urgency of of now. This is something that we need right now. Um for all of you all, if you all have a key takeaway, one or two things that you want the listeners to take away from this conversation, what what would that be? Um, I would say some of the key takeaways, excuse me, key takeaways uh, regarding inequities for IDD would be just the importance of culture competency, right? Training, the education. Um, the essentials to provide effective care. That's one. Um, two more I have uh, community engagement is a key. Uh, engaging, you know, with the community, critically building the trust and increasing awareness. And then lastly, advocate, advocating for policy change. Just requiring the policy changes to include advocacy to increase, um, you know, the services for IDD and just, you know, improve overall coverage and better support. For them and caregivers. Okay. Um, I I think my final thought would be, um, and I can't underscore what Olivia said enough, is that we need something now. Um, action on this is long overdue. Olivia, do you have a final thought that you want to share with the listeners? Um, no. I, I think you you have you summed up. Um, a lot of what um, our listeners need to learn and to do um, also is what I'm hearing that action is required and we need to stop just talking about stuff. Let's do something to um, get to equity and justice. So I want to thank you all. Thank you, Kalila, for starting and leading this work. Thank you, Olivia, for being here, sharing your experiences and being an advocate. Taj, thank you for your work as well as recording this in the airport. We really appreciate you being here. Um, To everyone who is listening, thank you for listening. We hope you found this engaging and we look forward to having you tune in for our next episode. And if you have any thoughts to add to the conversation, be sure to comment on our podcast episode page at Spreaker.com or on our social media channels. Thanks for listening. Thank you for joining us this episode of Partners for Advancing Health Equity. Be sure to visit our website and become a member of our collaborative at partnersforhealthequity.org. That's partners, the number four, healthequity.org. Follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And be sure to subscribe wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Partners for Advancing Health Equity is led by Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine is part of the Tulane Institute for Health Equity and is supported by a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Until next time.